Hello, this is Alex Voss, your professor in TV eCourse, and I want to welcome you to our section on transistors. And what a better place to do it than where I am right now, the campus of Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is one of the largest manufacturers of semiconductor products in the world and premier in the development of semiconductor and transistor technology. They started transistor technology production back in the 1950s and they're well known worldwide for their influence on semiconductor and transistor technology. Well, let's begin our course and have fun learning about transistors. Now, I've tried to make the uh, way we understand or look at alpha and beta current gain in the transistor as simple as possible. And I'll put some resources at the end of this uh, training where you can find more information on the web. But, you know, when we were doing the, um, the uh, Ohm's Law, and it was really easy to understand Ohm's Law if we made a circle and we put, uh, you know, different elements of, uh, you know, the voltage, the resistance, and the current uh, in, a tri in a triangle or a circle. And so to help us understand alpha and beta current gain in a transistor, I made a little uh, triangle here. And what we have is the collector current is at the top of the triangle and then the current gain and the base currents at the bottom and we'll have an imaginary line drawn here which didn't end up in this drawing and so basically it says the current gain is equivalent to let's go up here okay the current gain is equivalent to the collector current over the base current the base current is equivalent to the collector current over current gain the collector current is equivalent to the base current times the current gain. So if you look at your triangle here, if we want to find base current and we don't know it, then we can take collector current and divide it by current gain. Okay? If we want to find the current gain and we don't know it, we can take the collector current and divide it by the base current. If we want to find the collector current and we don't know it, then we can multiply current gain times base current. Okay? In some real world examples, for instance, let's say we want to find base current. Okay? And so, base current is found by collector current over current gain. In this, in this case, the collector current would be 0.12, okay, divided by 40, which is the current gain of the transistor, and that would equal to uh, 0 0.003 amps, or 3 milliamps. Here, we want to find the current gain, and that would be the collector current over the base current. Collector current, in this case, would be 0.4, and base current would be 0 0.002 and therefore the current gain in this particular transistor is 200. Up here we've got base current. We want to find base current. We know our collector current and our current gain. Or in this instance collector current is 0.5 and the current gain is 100 so it's 0.005 or 5 milliamps. Now lots of times, you know, people studying transistors, and of course we're going to go into a little more detail in the next part of this uh, training. This is part one of uh, transistor fundamentals. And, and, and we're going to go into the second part. We're going to talk about more complex equations and characteristic curves, which uh, we, we used to have. We had some devices that would actually sweep a transistor with a signal between the emitter, collector, and base, and it would see how the transistor reacted, and it could plot the characteristic curves of the transistor to show you how the transistor reacted under varying conditions. But a lot of people actually get caught up in, a, in trying to figure out transistor biasing. And so here I am trying to make it, I want to make it as simple as possible for us to understand basic transistor biasing. And so we've got to remember Kind of, the biasing term is determined a lot by the kind of transistor you're using. 
If you're using a silicon transistor, the biasing is going to be different than a germanium transistor. It's going to vary depending on the type of transistor you use, even if it is a silicon, compared to another silicon. So let's just talk about gener generalities here. The emitter base junction of a silicon transistor has to have at least something higher than 0.7 volts for conduction to occur between the emitter and the base. Because there's that depletion region in the transistor and, and it, it, it's, a, it's 0.7 volts of a depletion region, you have to overcome that before the transistor will start to conduct. If it's a germanium transistor, the same rules apply, except it's 0.3 volts for it to work. Now, now the collector base conduction connection is always reverse biased. Remember what we talked about earlier. If we were to use a silicon transistor and we want to talk about biasing to make that transistor run, okay, run anywhere from just turned on to full saturation. If we're using a silicon NPN transistor, the emitter base junction must be forward biased, meaning the emitter must be more negative than the base. We know then that the base must be 0.7 volts minimum higher than the emitter. For example, if the emitter is at 3 volts, and we make a we make a line here, okay, here's our transistor. If our emitter is at 3 volts, then we must have at least 3.7 volts on the base for that transistor to start conducting. Okay? So we're saying that that the emitter, the base has to be at least 0.7 volts higher than the emitter for it to start conducting. Okay? So we plot 3 volts on our line and the base has to be 7 volts and so 0.7 volts higher so we plot that on our line. This is a line representing voltage. This is 0 volts. This is positive volts. So as it goes over this way the voltage is getting more. So we're going to say that our transistor begins conduction at this point. Okay? At 3.7 volts. And we want the N-doped collector to be more positive than the P-doped base. This is an NPN, silicon NPN. And so let's just say that we have 8 volts here. And so what we've got here is we have 8 volts on our collector. And so that's sufficient to cause conduction from the emitter through the base to the collector of this transistor. But when I have the base at 3.7, then it begins to have conduction. And as I increase that base higher in this range, then I'm going to have more and more conduction as the base voltage is increased. And I want to invite you, if you want to, uh, go to Radio Shack or some electronic supply and get an NPN transistor and then put a battery on it and, and you might make some potentiometers where you can actually connect, a, uh, uh, let's just say that we have a potentiometer, our uh, emitter junction that we make at zero or zero volts by making it to ground and then we have a battery that we can vary the voltage using a potentiometer that would go like between uh, 3.7 up to 5-6 volts and then you use a potentiometer to feed a uh, change voltage here and then let's say we put something around 8 volts on the collector and you have a voltmeter off of the collector going to ground. Uh, once you have that another potentiometer running this and you have to experiment with it to get it to work. But I'll put a drawing on it uh, in, the, uh, in the information at the end of this uh, training. That you'll find that as you move the potentiometer change in the base voltage and you put a ohmmeter on this and you have a resistor dividing it between the transistor collector and uh, voltage supply, you'll find that the voltage will vary also on the collector, but uh, 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 the change of the output will be proportionately larger than the change on the input. But 
this is the basic on biasing. And uh, I always thought that was really interesting. A lot of people have a lot of trouble with that, but um, uh, it's it's still you know you just got to realize that for a transistor to conduct, if it's an NPN, and the same rules apply for a PNP. If it's silicon, except it's in a different direction, um, that if it's NPN for it to conduct, your base must be 0.7 volts higher than the, the emitter. And once you get a higher positive voltage than that, then the transistor goes to conduction. You have to have a much higher voltage on the collector for electrons to shoot over there to the collector. But once you once you do that, you find that once we start once we start getting the emitter base junction to conduct, then you know it just starts going into amplification depending on your collector bias. But the basics are you have to have 0.7 higher than the base for it to start conducting. As you increase, you have more conduction. You have to have a higher voltage applied to the collector for it to conduct well. Okay, now, um, you know, Shockley finally got what he wanted uh, with the uh, field effect transistor. And uh, it's, it, the field effect transistor is, uh, is an amazing thing. It's a little bit simpler than, um, than the uh, point contact or even the NPN. The field effect transistor FET uses an, uses an electric field to control the shape and hence the conductivity of a channel of uh, one type of charge carrier in a semiconductor material. FETs are also called unipolar transistors. Now if you remember our law of charges, like charges repel and unlike charges attract, if I make an electric field in a channel and let's say that I have a uh, channel and I'm trying to conduct electrons through it and then I put a negative field on either side of that channel then what's going to happen is the negative is going to repel the negative and I'm going to reduce the current flow through that channel and basically I'm narrowing the channel so less electrons can get through and that basically causes an appearance or an effect of a resistance change of the, uh, of the material. If we're looking here at this, um, this is sort of a drawing, this is a drawing of a uh, field effect transistor. We have a source and a drain. And the electrons are going to want to flow between these two points. I have a gate, which refers to something that would allow something to pass or not and so this gate is putting a field in this area and if I have electrons flowing through this area if I make a negative field in this area it's going to repel those electrons causing a reduction in the area where the electrons can flow through consequently I can make such a big field that it actually cuts off all flow through this structure Right here is another drawing, same thing. We have a source and a drain, and electrons are trying to flow through here. And I'm making a field from these two sides, and it's narrowing or increasing the channel, adjusting the conductivity through this transistor. This is a picture of a field effect transistor schematic diagram here. Here we have some layouts which I invite you to go on the internet and look at specific layouts. When you get a, a transistor you're going to want to actually, you know, you're going to have to go to some sort of information to determine of the three leads which is the base, which is the emitter, which is the collector, or if it's an FET, which is the source, which is the gate, which is the drain. And so you have to go to the different kinds of cases and you have to look up the case and the type of case will determine the position of the connections to the regions of the transistor. And this shows several different types of cases. We have like the TO72 case, the TO3 case, and they all have, you know, code numbers or letters that tell you what the case is. And you have to determine what kind of case your transistor has to determine the position of the connections to the regions, base emitter collector. 
Now there's some codes in here. Uh, usually the, the second letter in the transistor's marking describes its primary use. Like a C in the second marking of a transistor would mean that it's a low power to, and medium power low frequency transistor. Now what's the difference between the low frequency and high frequency transistors? Transistors that are, you know, the original transistors were not good at producing high frequencies. High frequencies means they can change fast. Their conductivity can change very fast. And so if I call it a low frequency transistor, that means it's a transistor that's not really good at high speed change. So C on the second letter of the transistor's marking would mean that it's a low and medium power low frequency transistor. A D would mean it's a high power low frequency transistor. An F would mean that it's a low power high frequency transistor. It means you could use it in high frequency radio or something. G is other transistors. L is a high power high frequency transistor. I could use this in a um, you know computer circuitry. It's running up in the megahertz, gigahertz range. I can use it in transmitters, UHF, VHF. It's a high frequency transistor. P is a phototransistor. It works with lights somehow. S is a switch transistor. It either turns off or on. It's not good with, with minute change. U is a high voltage transistor. Here's a few examples. An AC540 is a germanium core Low, low frequency, low power transistor. <coughs> An AF125 is a germanium core, high frequency, low power transistor. A BC107 is a silicon, low power transistor, low frequency. A BD675 is a silicon, low frequency, high power transistor. A, a BF199 is a silicon, high frequency transistor. A BU-208 is a silicon for voltages up to 700 volts. And a BSY-54 is a silicon switching transistor. Well, thank you for uh, attending our course today, and I'll see you in the next section on transistors. Okay, right, right now we're going to be sharing with you some resources. And if you look on your screen, you'll see several things listed that I would like you to look at. I'm giving you pointers to look at on the web. Uh, I recommend that uh, PBS program transistorized. I'm pointing you to several places where you can find good glossaries or transistor terms on the internet and other good resources like uh, in, was it NPTEL in India that has a lot of good information on transistors and I'll have them all here listed for you and I encourage you to check these resources out to increase your knowledge of transistor. Oh